I'm Scott Al Miller, and this is Sam IT, the channel where I teach you about technology, business, and all kinds of topics related today. I want to talk about MX records and how they are used in email flow. Because a lot of people use email but don't necessarily manage DNS, it is common for people to be familiar with the concept of MX records and may not be familiar with DNS more generally. We're going to do separate videos going into exactly how DNS works, what's important about it, how to manage it, and all those kinds of things. But today I want to touch on MX records specifically, because a lot of times I need to explain this either technically or to businesses, and I want to have a concise resource for this. When we're going to send an email, MX records play a very important role. As someone who's about to send an email, the world is very disjointed. We don't know where the person exists that we're going to send that email to, or more importantly, we don't know where their email server exists. If you're dealing with more modern systems that are not uh, uh, disconnected in the way that uh, email is uh, uh, decentralized, more modern systems tend towards the centralized, mostly because we have excellent enterprise class decentralized systems that are so mature, there's no reason to be competing in that space. But centralized systems are far younger and less mature, and so there is competition, especially because it is much easier to monetize centralized systems as a service. So you know centralized services such as Gmail, uh, internal usage, you have WhatsApp, you have Telegram, you have uh, Slack, all those kinds of things. They're centralized services where you have one server and everything th flows through a single vendor. That's great for a lot of purposes, but it has a lot of limitations, especially around security and privacy and assurances of, of privacy. So with that, email plays a very important role and in order to function, we need a way to find where our emails are going to go because every person on the planet has the option of running their own independent email server. Now, originally, we're going to do a little bit of DNS background here. Originally, when people first had email servers, they didn't have names. We didn't have domain names yet. That was a later concept. Host names did come along pretty quickly, but initially, we only had IP addresses. And even before IP addresses, we had other forms of addresses for different types of networks. But once the internet really became mature, we assume it is an IP address that we're going to be using in all cases. You could send, and still can, send an email to someone at an IP address as long as their server is configured to accept that email when it arrives. For security reasons and to prevent spam, it is very unpopular to accept unlisted uh, emails today. You're always going to have an email server configured to only accept them if a domain name is specified. But technically, you don't need to do that. And anyone who runs their own server is free to accept anything that arrives, even if it's just sent to the IP address, and of course, if you're building your own, you can do this to see how it works, and it can be very educational. But in the old days, this is how things worked. In fact, in the oldest days, that's all we had. You would send a message to an IP address, and that's all there was. Pretty quickly, they decided they needed mailboxes, and so the natural Scott at IP address started to pop up, and so we had mailbox associations, so we were able to assign a message to someone. Eventually, we put security on those things so that only I could see those messages that were coming to me, and so forth. It's a very organic growth in a very logical way. But pretty soon, and this was for lots of purposes, not just email, we needed a way to specify the system to which we were sending without having to know the IP address, and DNS was born. And when it came time to look up sending an email, the MX record was born. So in DNS, we have different record types. If you go look up ntg.co, the company that I work for, uh, you go look them up generically on a DNS lookup, you're going to get the address of the web server. That is what most people assume is going to come up then. But if you're looking up that exact same thing, but you do so from an email system, you would be unhappy with the results of the web server. That's just not going to make any sense. You want the results of the email server. So when you're doing that type of lookup, email systems know to specify that they're looking for an MX record rather than the traditional A record or quadruple A record. And when they do so, the system should return, the DNS system should return. And remember, we're going to have a video on DNS. So if you have any questions about that, certainly go to that video. It's going to return what's known as the MX record, which is the address or addresses of the mail server or mail servers that are available for, in this case, ntg.co. Now, if you have only a single MX record, it is this simple. You're going to receive the name of the mail server. That's all that's necessary. Not an IP address, but an actual name of the server. You then do an additional DNS lookup on that name of the server, 
to get its IP address, and then you can send onto there. This gives us a lot of flexibility when working with these kinds of records. It's very powerful and works extremely well. So in a simple case, you want to send a mail to me, scott at ntg.co, which I don't mean to give out on the YouTube video for some reason, but everyone can look it up pretty easily. So there you have it. That is how you send an email to me. When you go to do so, your email system is going to first look at the first part, say scott at. It says, I don't care about this because that is a mailbox that is for the receiving system. But it's going to look at the second part, the domain ntg.co and it's going to say I need to know where this is because I as the mail server need to send this out. Now there's some complications if you're doing a bunch of complicated things with email proxies and so forth we're ignoring that but at the end of the day this is what your email ecosystem is doing so so accept that there are cases where your server may not be the one doing this task but you're sending server whoever's representing you sending the SMTP message they are the ones doing this on your behalf. They go and they ask the DNS system hey who is the MX record for ntg.co? And they go and retrieve that and say, okay, it is this server. And then you can look up that IP address and send the message on. The difference between what we originally said and this, where you're sending to an IP address and you're doing all this lookup and sending to an IP address, is that when you send this message to me at ntg.co, it includes that you're sending to me at ntg.co and the receiving system, my system, will see that you're sending to ntg.co and say, okay, yes, that is legitimately one of the domains that I handle because it could handle many, but normally they're configured only to accept mail if they're a domain that is managed by that system or that that system is approved to manage. I don't want my own mail system accepting just any mail. I don't want people sending random things to gibberish, someone putting in a gibberish DNS entry, pointing to me and having it show up. I want that to disappear. I only want things that are actually sent to ntg.co to arrive in my mailbox. So my system is designed to filter that as essentially all email systems in the world are. Then it gets to me, then my system will go through its normal checks and say, is this really for ntg.co? Do I feel it's spam? It'll do whatever checks it feels like. Then it'll say, okay, who is this for? It'll look at the first portion and say, oh, this is for Scott and deliver it to me. Now, if I have a more complex system, that, what we just described, is with a single MX record, but you can easily have multiple MX records. It's common to have two or three of them. Why would you do this? Well, there's two basic reasons. One is failover. If you have one system that's not working, having more listings meaning means when something doesn't work, you can move on to a different system in the list and try it. This gives you some failover or protection. Should one system be rebooting, be down for some reason, you could have them located in very different uh, areas and different data centers uh, for reliability. You can do this where they have all the same records, everything's identical, and it will do round robin under normal circumstances. We're going to get to that. Uh, or you can give them wait. When you're looking at an MX record, you have the name of the server that it's going to be sending to. You have a time to live for the record length, which is how long that record is good before you're supposed to look it up again. And you have a wait. The wait tells the system that is receiving the information which of these servers gets priority. However, this is super important. What your system is going to do with that is up to your system. If I give a list of servers and say, this is the primary, only use these when it's down, your system doesn't have to honor that. It can do whatever it wants. It's going to get instructions from the DNS system, but they there's nothing to enforce them. So just be aware that you may be thinking you're handing out round robin, and it may work that way, or it may not. It depends. You may put in a certain weighting system, and it may be honored, or it may not. Some spammers actually target the opposite of the weighting system, hoping to get around some kind of checks and balances. Now, that can happen. Those are things to just be aware of, that you have no control. What you in DNS, someone can get and use, and there's nothing you can do about it. Because it's a decentralized system, what they do, you can only provide them information, they can do what they want. The theory is that if you have a number of records that all have the same weight, that systems should choose to pick them either at random or in a sequence or some way weighting them so that they're all equal. If you give different records different weights, Different systems treat these in different ways. Some attempt to balance them. So, for example, if you weight one with 10, one with 30, one with 50, you expect the one with 10 to get maybe 
70% of the request, the one with 30 to get 20%, and the one with 10 to get 10%. That's one option that an email system sending may choose to do. A lot of systems will simply try the lowest priority or the highest priority, depending on how you look at it. The lowest number is the highest priority. So that one that's weighted with 10, it may send all traffic to there unless it stops responding and then try the next one on the list. Or it may ignore the list completely and only use the first one and never do the failover that it's supposed to do. Or maybe it'll wait them, it'll ignore the waiting, but it'll take all of them and just round robin. They can do anything that they want. You simply don't have control. But there are certain behaviors that are the expected. And if you look at your traffic load, they are honored most of the time and it generally works. So if you're looking to do load balancing, that's generally easy to do. And that is the complete role of the MX record. So let's replay this just to make sure you understand what's going on. I have an email system and I want to send an email to you. I receive your URL, your domain name from you. You send it to me on a piece of paper or whatever. You tie it to a cat's leg and wait for it to stop by and try to steal some food from my counter. I find the email and I decide to send you a message. Hey, I have your cat. I take that message and I put it into my email system. My email system attempts to send the message and the first thing it says is, I don't know who this is. I have no idea. So here's their domain lostmycat.com. I'm going to do a DNS lookup and say I'm a mail system. I want the MX record for lostmycat.com. They receive the name of your email server, not the IP address, but the A name of it, or it could be a C name. Those things look up the same. Then my system will then additionally do another lookup and say, okay, I've got this A record or maybe a C record. What's its IP address? And it'll send that in and it'll receive the IP address. Now we have an IP address to send that message to. So it's going to take that message that I wrote and send it via SMTP to the address, to the server listed at the address. Uh, via just direct address, but with the name of your domain in it. Once you receive it, then your system can do whatever it decides to do with that message once it has arrived. MX records are incredibly simple. They are just a white pages lookup mechanism with a note that it is meant for email and not for other purposes and with the ability to have multiple listings so that if one doesn't work, you may try another and or a system for listing multiple so that you can at random pick one and keep it kind of load balanced. That is the entirety of how the system works. It is worth noting that some uh, DNS systems will use the weighting and return a list with different numbers on top based on the weighting. So sometimes it is the DNS system that does that work but again, your DNS system doesn't have to always do what is predictable, and so you can't always depend on it. But that is something that you would expect. That's partially what makes the system work as well as it does. As always, I highly recommend, at least this is very prescient, but if you're watching this video in real time, or probably any time in the foreseeable future, I highly recommend that you use Cloudflare as your DNS host. They offer the best DNS options broadly available on the market. They are enterprise grade and they are absolutely free, leaving you with really no reason not to be using them. They come with a lot of features long, far beyond what DNS alone would do, uh, but they also offer some of the best DNS features on the market. So definitely check them out. This is not sponsored. I true IT recommendation. This is what I use. This is what I use for many years. Every time I move a customer to them, it makes our lives better. They're more secure. They're faster. They're more flexible. It's a very, very good choice. We expect places that are doing a good job to be on Cloudflare unless they have a very specific need driving them somewhere else. Normal people should never look beyond Cloudflare. It is the absolute best general purpose DNS on the market. I hope that that helps explain MX Records to you. If you're looking for support for anything like this, whether it's email, understanding DNS, training your team, security, or an outsourced IT department in its entirety, whatever it is that you need, hit us up at ntg.co. My name is Scott Allen Miller. I have been working there now for 25 years. We specialize in bringing a broad range of IT solutions to companies of absolutely all sizes. We certainly work with the Fortune 10. We also work with mom and pa shops on Main Street. We work globally and we are not a reseller. We have no products that we represent or sell. We are pure IT. Our only people to represent are you. We are there, we're your advocates as true IT. So thanks for joining me. If you have questions, absolutely get down there in the comments and ask away. I'm always glad to answer questions where possible and it gives me options for more uh, videos in the future. I love being able to make these and I apologize for the big gaps we have sometimes in making these videos. I get very busy. I'm actually a full-time YouTuber on some other channels and uh, this one kind of fell by the wayside. We're gonna get back to it. Thanks for joining me.
See you all next time.